We'll now kick off with Karen and um, her presentation. So if you would like to come forward, Karen, and take the podium. Thank you again for the invitation to come along today, and particularly thank you to Raynard for inviting me along, uh, particularly to talk about this report. Uh, I would like to start just by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Jaja Wurrung people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. The theme for today's conference, Embracing Change and Diversity in a Dynamic and Evolving Legal Profession, is one clearly closely linked with the Commission's mm -hmm. work and certainly shows LRV's commitment to tackling contemporary issues facing the profession, as well as, as well as we know those issues are facing both business and professional sectors, and we'll certainly hear about that later on this morning. I've been asked to talk about two topics, changing the rules, the experiences of female lawyers in Victoria, the Commission's report on women in the law in Victoria released in December, and briefly the implications and requirements of the recently released Workplace Gender Equity Act. Changing the Rules was developed in cooperation with the Law Institute of Victoria and Victorian Women Lawyers. It was prompted by concerns about the high attrition rates of women from the profession. Since the 1990s, more than half the graduates from law schools have been women, yet retention, promotion and attrition are a cause for concern for the whole profession. A New South Wales report found 50% of women taking out their first practising certificate won't be in the law five years after admission. The findings of the report indicate a profession with systemic barriers to effective workforce participation for women. Despite the high numbers of women entering the profession, it doesn't seem that the legal sector has necessarily, across the board, adapted to that changed demographic. The barriers identified in the report were based in the Commission's jurisdiction, so they very much reflect the work that we do in discrimination and sexual harassment. So issues like the gender pay gap, access to flexible work hours and other supports for family and carer responsibilities, access to promotion, workplace issues, workplace culture and sexual harassment were really the themes of the report, but I acknowledge that that was also partly driven by the fact that it was based in our jurisdiction. We also wanted to know what was working well, so there are very positive stories in the report and I'm very happy to report on some of those and you'll hear about some of those this morning. The research was guided by a critical friends group, which included Michael Holcroft and Carolyn Council, Michael Gordon, Debbie Mortimer, Beth Gaze and Patricia Athanasinades. The report is based on a survey of over 400 responses from women working in the sector currently. It was based on focus groups and interviews with key informants, so it was very current information at the time that we published it in December. Overall, the report shows that despite the prevalence of women in the law, there is evidence that the sector is struggling, is struggling to meet the needs of that change demographic. 196 women, or close on 50% of respondents, said they'd personally experienced discrimination or witnessed it while working as a lawyer or legal trainee over the last two years. Discrimination included a hostile work environment, workplace bullying, unfair work allocation and unequal pay. 70% of those reporting discrimination in current or former workplace worked in a private law firm. We also asked about sexual harassment. 100 or almost 24% said they had experienced sexual harassment. Sexual harassment was likely to occur in the early stages of the career with 63% of the incidents reported occurring in the first 12 months. 52% said there was more than one harasser, suggesting that there was a culture where these attitudes are normalised. We also asked about accommodating parental and carer responsibility. The feedback we got was that having a family is a major barrier to women progressing their careers in the private sector, in the private law sector. 35% of survey participants had asked for flexible work arrangements. Fortunately, 95% of women who'd asked for those flexible work arrangements had the request approved or partially approved. However, there were repercussions associated with that. Many women reported that they experienced hostile, they felt pressure to increase their work hours, they were asked to do more work due to technology outside the hours that they had been agreed, or that the work allocation changed once those flexible arrangements were put in place. So while there was a high level of compliance with the request for flexible work arrangements, uh, there was a backlash associated with that. It was also significant to <coughs> us that six out of ten women who had experienced discrimination didn't make a complaint, either internally or externally, and one in four did not tell anyone or seek help. Generally, there was a sense that women felt unsupported in the workplace, they, fe they fear the repercussions of complaining, they don't report, they often leave the workplace and certainly there was a trend of that behaviour in the responses that we got in the report. Most of all women were reluctant to complain in case they were labelled. 
it's a small, well-networked profession as we know, and people are concerned about being labelled a problem and having that label follow them around the sector. We did also have a look at other data sources like EOA, which showed women were not progressing at anywhere near the same rates as men through career steps from graduate through to partner. So the systemic nature and experiences of discrimination and issues around unconscious bias must, we think, contribute in part to the high levels of attrition. But there is good news. We did hear many examples of positive practice in the profession, and clearly there are many very successful women, lawyers, partners, barristers and judges, some represented here, have demonstrated what a great profession the law can be and how supportive it can be for women. It's clear that individual legal practices, the Law Institute of Victoria, Victorian women lawyers and other professional bodies are tackling these systemic <coughs> and organisational issues. One firm we spoke to started work on this 10 years ago when the CEO realised that women were 60% of the graduates entering the firm, but they only made up 30% of the partners. Policies around bullying, flexible work, etc. weren't proving to be enough. The issue required proactive steps, and the firm now has even attrition rates between men and women, and around 60% of senior associates are female. Another implemented key triggers like pay equity audits, setting KPIs around gender targets, and importantly, embedding flexible workplace practices for all employees. And I know you'll hear more about that this morning. While anecdotally it's argued that culture around billable hours is, is a significant issue, we also know there are many success stories, and I'm hoping we'll hear about some of those today. So we aren't suggesting that the sector should undertake this work because it's fair or the right thing to do, or only because it's fair and the right thing to do. And of course, there's the Equal Opportunity Act to think about. I have to sort of mark up my own legislation here as well. There are genuine business benefits for diversity, and I know we'll hear about those today. And as we all know, getting more out of existing staff is by far a better strategy than battling churn. The Commission recently partnered with Deloitte on a project to try and put some numbers around the business benefits of diversity and inclusion, and I've got some copies of that report here today. What it showed was that employees who think their organisation is committed to and supportive of diversity and who feel included are more likely to make a positive contribution to the bottom line. You can have a lot of women and diversity in your firm, you can have a lot of great policies, but unless people feel valued and included, the rest doesn't have any impact. The Act has changed clearly from the Equal Opportunity Act for women in the workplace to a focus on gender equality, highlighting equal pay, under-representation of women in leadership positions and caring responsibilities as key dimensions. The new Act still requires that all non-public sector employers with 100 or more employees report annually to the agency. Employers must also notify employees, members and shareholders that the report has been lodged, provide access to the report and allow them to comment either to the agency or to the employer on the, on the report. As of 2013-14, Changes will be made to the substance of the report. Employers will be required to report against yet to be determined standardised gender equality indicators that focus more on outcomes rather than simply the reporting process. This will allow clearly for results to be measurable and comparable and to track trends. Gender equality indicators are defined in the Act as meaning gender composition of the workforce, gender composition of governance, equal remuneration, availability of flexible conditions, consultation with employees on issues concerning gender equality, and the catch-all, of course, any other matter specified in an instrument to be determined by the Minister. In the 2014-15 reporting period, employers will need to continue to report against gender equality indicators, but minimum standards will be introduced under consultation. If an employer submits a report that doesn't meet minimum requirements and does not improve by the end of two further reporting periods, it can be deemed non-compliant. The consequences of non-compliance, I know, sometimes have uh, not necessarily discouraged people. Um, but they are now being linked, as we know, to uh, being eligible for Commonwealth contracts. And they will no doubt, as we know, uh, with an increased degree of transparency, have an impact on recruitment and retention issues in an increasingly competitive market. Overall, the changes to the Act require employers to focus on measuring progress on gender equality rather than just simply reporting what's happening. So the focus on gender equality is more than just a sector imperative. The Gender Equality Act and laws like the Equal Opportunity Act make it an obligation, but the business case shows gender equality must be a priority for the legal profession. 
After 30 years of discrimination law, we know that very well. They require positive, proactive steps to be taken to identify the barriers and to address them. It requires leadership, sharing of information and practical incremental steps. In fact, it pretty much reflects the Positive Duty and the Equal Opportunity Act, which now obliges all of us to do this anyway. While the focus on diversity today and for this work this year clearly reflects the business imperatives of the sector, and I have to say reflects the business imperatives of all the sectors that we deal with in my organisation, building, we can build on the lessons from the gender experience. And certainly my commission is keen to work with the Law Institute of Victoria and organisations within the sector on seeing those principles translate into practice. Thanks very much for your time this morning.